much alert. So I want to commend you for being here. Let me pray. Father, we just thank you that uh, you're the God who watches over all. You tell us in your word that what time I am afraid, I will trust in you. So I pray that we recognize our protection really is you, but as parents, we have an opportunity to watch over, care for, and help protect our children. So Father, we pray for the family that uh, lost their daughter. We pray for comfort and just a spirit of encouragement to them uh, that only you can provide. So thank you for being here tonight. For I pray in Jesus' name, amen. So John Gregory with the Samaritan Counseling Services of the Gulf Coast, welcome. Thank you, John. Thank you, Pastor Tom. We are privileged to be able to come and share this evening. Uh, before I introduce the panel, we just want to, uh, as Pastor Tom already referenced, we just want to acknowledge, you know, the reason that we're here was because a suicide, you know, took place a couple of weeks ago. And without that event, we wouldn't be here. Um, most likely, we wouldn't be, have bothered to show up and have this conversation tonight. Uh, I understand that uh, the city of Northport is providing an event next Thursday night that is uh, more geared toward the subject of suicide, suicide awareness and prevention. So tonight, we're focusing more on the bullying side of that. And so we have a great opportunity. I just have to say, as a, I live in Manatee County, uh, I'm proud of Sarasota County for responding and not ignoring what is going on and trying to help and trying to serve the community. So uh, we're glad to be able to be here and uh, offer what we can for that support this evening. We have two of our, let me back up. I'm John Gregory, the Community Care Director at Samaritan Counseling Services of the Gulf Coast. And Pastor Tom invited us to come this evening and share with you about how we can help our parents and our students when they're experiencing bullying. And so when he called me, uh, we immediately say yes, and then I had to figure out how we're gonna do this. <laughs> These ladies are the response to that. So uh, I'll introduce them, and then we're gonna get into the PowerPoint. If you didn't get a copy of the PowerPoint, it's back on the table, back in the lobby. It looks like this, this is the front page of it. So I encourage you to get a copy if you didn't. It will be on the screen as well, uh, but you can follow along if you'd like and take notes as we have that. So our three panelists tonight, uh, two of them are on our staff at Samaritan, and then we have, we're have we blessed to have Amy with us, so I'll introduce Amy first. Amy Weinberger is with the Lean On Me Project uh, through NAMI, and she serves uh, all the, well, many of the schools here in Sarasota County, and I was so grateful that she could join us because of her connection with so many uh, educators and parents and students in Sarasota County, so thank you for joining us this evening, Amy. And then to her left is two of our staff members from Samaritan, uh, Griselle Feisthamel and then Kelly C. And all, th all three of them are going to lead us through the PowerPoint. We're gonna try to get through the PowerPoint in roughly 30 minutes, and then we'll take the rest of our time to answer questions that you may have that you'll use those cards that Pastor Tom mentioned to submit your questions. I'm gonna start going through a couple of the slides of the PowerPoint and then I'll pass it off to Kelly and they'll just pass it off as we go through the PowerPoint. So first of all, that we want to just quickly give some definitions to what we're talking about tonight. And the first slide that you'll see gives a definition of bullying. And this is just our working definition for tonight. But it says bullying is intentional, repeated, predatory, targeted, and antagonistic behavior. All of those words are important. You know, targeted, repetitive, antagonistic. All of those words are important there. It says it involves an imbalance of power that contributes to the silent misery of millions of students and puts some at increased risk for suicidal thoughts and behaviors. And then you see some statistics there. One of the, I think, most helpful statistic there is roughly one out of five students is experiencing this. That's not an insignificant number. When you think about the thousands of students, I believe you can help me, Amy, if I'm wrong here. I think the number of students in Sarasota County is something around 50,000. How many? 50,000. Yes. Yeah. So that's, you know, 20% of 50,000 is not a small number, just to give you an idea of what we're talking about. And that last bullet point on that slide uh, was a wake-up call to me personally when I read that, that most more likely to happen, uh, bullying is more likely to happen in elementary school. 
in middle school or high school. By the way, all of these notes uh, are put together from all the handouts that feels like thousands of handouts that we have back there for you in the lobby. But all of the material that we're sharing with you is in that material and you can look at that on your way out. So that gives you some definition of what bullying is. On the next slide, you see what bullying is not. And one of our panelists uh, mentioned that this was important to bring up just to help children understand, help students understand when they use the term bullying, we want to educate them about what it is and what it is not. So these statements here are some illustrations to help them and help parents and even there may be some of you in the room, uh, you're raising your grandkids and they're at your house. Uh, this is all for all of us to help them understand what it is and what it is not. So examples, excluding someone on the playground, not inviting them to a party. If that's a one-time thing and it's not target, back to the definition, if it's not targeted, if it's not repeated, it's not antagonistic, then that wouldn't be bullying. You see the difference there? So that the rest of these follow that same kind of thinking. And one of the things that I know our panelists are going to touch on is for us as adults to keep in mind that children, they're on a, they're on a growth trajectory emotionally. And things that may make sense to us or like they should happen quickly, they're still in the process of learning these things. So this slide gives us some illustrations to help them learn what is and what is not bullying. And I think that can be really helpful to us as we go through the conversations with our students. I'm gonna go ahead and pass uh, the microphone off to Kelly. She's gonna come up and talk about the next couple of slides, uh, talking about targets and forms of bullying and signs of bullying and uh, signs when a student is bullying others. So Kelly, you'll come and share about those things. Hello. Okay. Um, I, I actually thought we were going to be talking from there, but that's okay. <laughs> Change, up. Change up. It's good to stand. You know, we're wearing heels tonight. Might as well stand. Um, so let's talk about targets of bullying and forms of bullying. So targets of bullying, those being bullied, essentially are those who are perceived as being different than their peers. And um, our PowerPoint gives several examples, but Again, these are students who are perceived to be different in any way, shape, or form, whether it's racially, whether it's their family dynamic, like maybe they don't have a mom and dad, maybe they've got two moms, two dads, raised by grandparents, or a single parent. Um, this can be somebody who just doesn't fit in with their peers, they don't have the same interests, they don't have the same um, things in common. But let's look at forms of bullying. So we've got, we've got direct, indirect, and cyberbullying. And there can be an overlap between the categories. Direct bullying is commonly seen in males. Um, it can include verbal abuse or physical aggression, but that's not, those are some examples. Indirect bullying um, is more often seen in females. And this can include, but is not limited to things like name calling, social isolation, defamation, or rumor spreading. And then we've got cyberbullying, which can overlap with indirect bullying. Any kind of bullying that's carried out through social, um, through electronic media, very commonly like social media. If you know someone's being gossiped about, they're taking pictures of, say, a girl or boy, making fun of them. Okay. All right. So signs of being bullied, um, there are quite a few. So with signs of being bullied, we're looking at quite a few things, and you may notice some or all of these signs. They can include difficulty with peer relationships, so someone who has trouble making friends or someone who has trouble maintaining friendships. The, um, someone can have trouble concentrating or sleeping. They might have nightmares. We're looking at a little, some form of trauma. They can be afraid to go um, to school. They might lose interest in activities they normally enjoy. You might see declining grades. We can see an increase in risk-taking or aggressive behavior. You can also notice family dysfunction, so maybe there's interpersonal conflict, increased stressors in the household, um, and this can also include friendships. And then we can also see things like anxiety and depression, low self-esteem, and hopelessness. Um, we can also see um, 
damaged belongings, unexplained bruises or cuts. And then we had mentioned earlier that you know, your child may also be the one bullying others. And so these are just some of the signs that you may notice. So this can be someone who gets into physically um, or verbally um, type of fights that get increasingly aggressive. They may be surrounded by peers who bully others. They may get sent to the principal's office or to detention frequently for a variety of reasons. You may notice that they have unexplained items such as extra money or new belongings. They may blame others for their problems or they don't accept responsibility for their actions. And they may be competitive or worried about things like reputation or popularity. trying not to trip over all the wires. So my name is Grizel. I'm a licensed mental health counselor, and I do work with a lot of teens and young adolescents and children who do report to me that they're being bullied. So I'm going to talk about cyberbullying. So I don't want to use any of my clients' stories, so I'm going to use some personal stories from when I was a teenager because I just want to respect their privacy. So how many of us remember MySpace? Any hands? OK. so. There is a movie called Cyberbullying that started when MySpace became a thing and cyberbullying became more popular. Um, so when I was in high school, I got cyberbullied on MySpace and it was quite horrific. So the issue with cyberbullying is that it happens behind closed doors, right? You might not know who it is. They can have multiple identities. It's very secretive. Um, or it can be very public and it could be someone at school who's incredibly popular and there could be thousands, hundreds of students bullying one child or multiple children. For me, it was like three girls, but one of my friends in high school was cyberbullied and she had a lot of death threats, a lot of death notes online. So I told my friend she could go to the vice principal and we can ask for help. Unfortunately, the vice principal said that since my friend responded, she could not do anything about it because she responded to the death threats. So we're gonna talk about how can we help our kids when they're being cyberbullying, because now there's more than MySpace and more than Facebook. Now we have Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok, et cetera. So the first thing we can do is teach responsible use of technology to our children to prevent the use of um, technology to harass other children, right? So passwords, who's on the other end, hours that it can and cannot be used code of conduct, appropriate posts, and sometimes just talking with our children about what they're posting and doing on social media, having that safe flow of conversation, and also conversations they're having with other people, because sometimes the bully can be adults when it's online, not just children. Another one is discuss cyberbullying as soon as they start using the technology, letting them know this is possible and that it does happen so they know that it's okay to talk about, that it does not have to be secretive, because a lot of kids who are being cyberbullied do not talk about it. The next is talk with them about being safe online, just like being safe at school. So the issue with cyberbullying is that there's a sense of no peace. It's not only happening at school, it's happening everywhere because we carry a phone in our, in our pocket. So it could follow you home, it can follow you on the bus, it can follow you in the movie theater. So there's no peace, there's no privacy, there's no being alone. This bullying is constantly following you everywhere. And now we could say, well, just delete all the apps, but sometimes that's their only form of communication with their friends. And they want to feel plugged in, right? And we don't want them to feel like they're being punished for other people's behaviors. So we really need that flow of conversation and teaching them how to keep themselves safe online. The next one is number four, encourage them to tell you when something online is hurtful. Commit to work together to address it. So we really need to honor child-sized problems because that's what is child-sized problems and these are children. So for us, it might not seem like a big deal, but for them in their developmental stage where they don't have as much power as we do and not as much freedom, this is a really big deal for them. So we really have to honor that this is problematic for them and it is very hurtful. So we have to be very empathetic towards these children when they're going through cyberbullying or any type of bullying. Um, another one is just, you know, this is less personal. So it's not like bullying at school. This is less personal, so it's easier for the bully to be more threatening. It is easier for the bully to have multiple identities, and it's easier for the bully to target more people or multiple people targeting one child. So that's a really big thing to keep in mind. 
Next, we're gonna talk about overcoming bullying. So there's a few steps here, right? So the first step, assist your student to intentionally connect to at least one trusted adult at school. So remember when I said that we went to the vice principal in my school and nothing was done? So I have multiple kids coming to me saying that they're going to people, adults at their school, and nothing is being done. So I really encourage being very intentional when a child reaches out to you. I also sometimes tell parents for them to reach out to the school as well because some kids don't even want to go to school because of how bad the bullying is and how helpless they feel. Because remember, child-sized problem. They don't have as much freedom as we do. They don't have as much power as we do. To encourage your student to talk about their bullying experience. So encouraging doesn't mean interrupting them or and it doesn't mean you know, bringing in your perspective. It means really listening to them, being really empathetic, kind of saying like, it sounds like you're really hurt because of this experience. What can I do to help you? That's what's gonna really encourage your children to be open with you guys about being bullied. Three, discuss with them the difference between reporting and ratting. So this is really important because when I tell kids to report that they're being bullied to an adult at school or at home, they feel like, well, you know, um, snitches get stitches, right? And it's like, no, that's not how that works. So when you're reporting, it's because you want a change to happen, a positive change to happen. You want things to get better. When you're ratting, it's because you want to hurt another person or you want to gossip about somebody. So you really have to tell them the difference between reporting and ratting so they don't feel bad about reporting to an adult that they're getting bullied. Number four, model and teach respectful behavior. So kids learn from watching the adults in their lives, and you never know what child is watching you, right? So we really want to model appropriate behaviors towards other individuals. So they're gonna hear us when we make comments about strangers on the street or when we make comments about people on TV, even as people we don't like or people that we don't agree with, um, either be their lifestyle or their religion or etc. We really want to model respectful behaviors because that's what they're going to mimic. And sometimes those kids see that in us and they say, well, I don't follow their religion or I don't follow their um, behavior patterns or I don't follow their values, so maybe they don't like me. So we're also modeling to a child who might be being bullied and letting them know what their value is. And we could probably be affirming what the bullies are telling them depending on our behavior towards other people. Um, number five, recognize bullying as a mental health and relationship issue. It's not their fault. So I don't know if some of y'all heard the saying, um, victim blaming. And it's pretty much in the word, blaming the victim for something that they didn't cause to happen. So sometimes what I hear when a child reports bullying from parents is, well, if only you stopped being so weird, if only you stopped doing this, if only you stopped doing that, then you wouldn't be bullied anymore. And that's what we would call victim blaming. This is more of a mental health issue. This is more of learning how to respect people for their differences and loving each other. So we really do not want to encourage that they're less than because they're different from other people. Instead, we want to stand up for these kids and speak up for them instead of telling that they should change who they are in order for people to like them. And then number six, encourage them to pursue friendships, to walk with an adult or an older child. So connection is incredibly important, but in order to fuel connection, we have to develop empathy with these people. Um, so for children, we need to teach them how to connect to other children and to other adults in order to have safe people to go to, but we also have to define what does that mean? Who are these safe people? Where are these safe places? So safe people are people who respond em empathetically to you. They're people who accept you for who you are. If they give you feedback, it's more of a loving feedback um, because maybe you're doing something that's not helpful or healthy for you, and it's someone who's gonna help you get the right help. Number seven, identify safe areas, neighbors, home, library, for them to go to if they feel threatened. And also phone numbers for them to contact and make sure that you're being responsive when they do contact you, or else they're not gonna ask for help again. Because there is a learned helplessness when you reach out for help and nothing is done. So mindset, parents and students. So what we're think talking about is the mindset that we have when we approach our children and the mindset we want to instill in them when it comes to growth and change. So how social challenges at school are viewed affects the level of stress. So we really need to change the way we view school stress. We need to change the view of it's not a big deal, it's just high school, it's just middle school, it's just elementary school. We really need to honor child-sized problems, which is a really big thing that I think of when I work with my students because I'm not in that phase of life anymore, so I don't fully understand it in the stage that I'm in. 
But if I go back to when I was a teenager or when I was a little kid, I remember those things were a big deal to me back then. So really putting yourself in their position to understand where they're coming from. And then belief change and growth is possible. So sometimes kids will come in and say, nothing's gonna change. Everything's gonna be the same. It's all gonna be bad. I'm always gonna be bullied and nobody's gonna care. We really wanna change that mindset. We really don't wanna use all or nothing thinking around our kids. So change, we always disagree on everything which is common for parents and kids to say when they're arguing. But instead, we can practice saying, sometimes we disagree on something, but sometimes we agree. Sometimes things are hard, and sometimes we have to put a little bit of effort, and sometimes things come easy to us. And sometimes we feel stuck, but if we work really hard, things can change. So we really want to encourage that kind of mindset. And then I'm going to pass on the baton to Amy and not leave my iPad. <laughs> well, good evening. Um, I'm so honored to be here amongst us together. Uh, my name is Amy Weinberger, and I am with the Lean On Me Project. I'm with one of the co-founders, and we are with NAMI, National Alliance on Mental Illness, and we have a Sarasota Manatee ca uh, chapter in our counties, in both counties. And we're, in ver we're very active. We have something called Youth Moves. We have a youth programmer. Her name is Taylor Walker. And the purpose of the Lean On Me project and why this is so important to us and to make sure that we connect is because we're in the schools. So um, we are in as many schools as the principals and assistant principals allow us to be. And we're there for teacher programming and initiatives, students, uh, parents, and our, of course, community. So um, the slide that we're on right now on parent, uh, parenting against bullying, I'd like to throw out some language for us to think about as we are parenting and grandparenting and aunting and uncling and all the things that we do and all the different hats that we wear in relationships. So the first word I'd like to throw out is connectivity. Our children today are not feeling connected. They are not feeling connected to their parents sometimes. I will give you an example. The co-founder of the Lean On Me Project is Jordan Stonecipher. She is 26 uh, years old. She just had a birthday. She is the co-founder with me. I asked her to come along. She's been a student of mine since she was eight years old. And around her senior year, um, I noticed that her behavior was really quite not great. And so I took her out to lunch and we were sitting at one of those round tables and you know so you're pretty close at a round table right like you can really see the person's face. And I lean into her a little bit and I say to her what's this right here? She goes you can notice? I'm like sweetie it's purple. And she goes well I got a tat, a tattoo. And I said well okay why is the tattoo in your mouth? as she said, because I was trying to find, defy my parents. And that's when I said, have your parents seen this tattoo? And she said, no. And that's when I knew there was no connectivity and no one was having dinner together. That's what connectivity is, that you see your child, your teenager. When that isn't happening, things go very wrong fast. And boy, did things go wrong for her fast. Luckily, we were able to do some interventions. So I, when you're looking at this particular slide, um, I want to kind of look at number um, six first. Because reaching out to students who are being bullied, bullying does, doesn't just happen in schools. We adults can bully our kids too into, like, oh, you know, normative behaviors when really I like anime and I like cartoons and maybe I like tattoos and long hair and maybe I like my eyelashes to be fake and wear those big long eyelashes. It doesn't make me less of a person so mommy and daddy please don't push me into a shell. I'm expressing myself. Maybe I shouldn't wear it to church but I'm going to wear it to school. So can you help me? So one of the things that happens in connectivity is that we're always pushing. There's this argument and argument, right? Where, because we don't think what they're doing is right. So we have to really sit down with our children and our teens 
And we have to ask them, hey, what's going on with you? What's happened to you, not what's wrong with you? I'm going to say that again. What has happened to you? Your behaviors have really changed, I've noticed. Uh, you're not eating dinner with us anymore. What's been happening with you, but not what's wrong with you? Because your child will not tell you that. And that's really important language to shift up. Now let's go to our number one on our parents' parenting and getting bullying, where it says reinforce tolerance for diversity. So diversity isn't always a person of color. Uh, diversity can be a person of a different religion. It can be of a person who has a different hairstyle. It can be a person who has neurodiversity. They are perhaps living with autism. Perhaps they are living with a mental health illness. Perhaps they are living with a parent who has been Baker acted. Perhaps they are living with a parent, uh, same couple, same sex couple parent who are now divorcing just like the heterosexual couple is now divorcing. So it, it's not, it, this neurodiversity, we're all a little neurodiverse. <laughs> so if we can accept that about ourselves, then we can accept each other a little bit easier. If we look at number two, reinforcing positive activities and behaviors to replace bullying behaviors. Let me just say, Unless we are looking at our own behaviors and how we are speaking to each other, please don't expect our children to change. We are the ones that they look up to. And if they are looking up to us, then we have to be magnificent as much as we can be and be intentional. When we are just using gossip or if we are saying something mean, our child picks that up. I will give you an example. I had the pleasure of meeting up with one of my girlfriends a couple weeks ago. We were at Simon's and we were outside eating and I was sitting here what, and I, so I could see this family and it, there was a mom there with two beautiful girls in the middle of the day. I, maybe they were homeschooling, maybe they were visiting and the thing that happened on that day was so desperate to me. The mom was, was very into her Instagram feed and she was very into her looks in, in a way that was um, obsessing, actually. And that's not a judgment, that's actually what was happening. And the daughter, she was asking the daughter to take a lot of pictures of her. And that entire time we were there for an hour and a half or two hours, that mom never talked to the children. It was Instagram, Instagram, picture, picture, picture. When the food came out, she was on her phone. The girls were craving conversation. Finally, one of the daughters sneezed. And I said, bless you. And the mom, um, 15 minutes, seconds later, said, oh, well, thank you. And the daughter looked at me. We made eye contact. And I just nodded and smiled. They were craving interaction. We are sometimes the problem. And until we step back, look in the mirror and understand our relationships and our connectivity, we can't change our children until we change ourselves. Let's go to slide 11. This is just emphasizing what I just said about looking at our own behaviors. Um, and I'd like to talk about um, the internet and I'd like to talk about um, television watching if we can shut things down around, about two hours before children are supposed to go to sleep, I don't mean a 17-year-old, but I do mean elementaries and sixth graders, because that, that's a middle school student, that gives our brain a chance to relax. Or if we can get some energy out and interact and connect. So look at what we're doing bef those two hours before. Do we have routines in place? Can we be helpful to our children and our grandchildren in that way? Can we observe things? Uh, our, my colleagues talked about honoring child size problems. What is not a big deal to us is a really big deal to them. And that is so important to pause. We call it pause, think, parent. Instead of reactive, we respond. And the last thing I'd like to leave with you, um, I think, am I on, yeah. The last thing I'd like to leave with you in, is on uh, the next slide. So we have the word permanent solutions. What we mean by permanent solutions is the ability to go, you know what, 
this is how we want to be for now, because when someone gets a little older, we have to change something. So just like we have a driver's license, we should have a moment to understand how to use internet. It's called commonsensemedia.org if you need a resource. We have a family anti-bullying contract that's out on the table. And this is a really good thing to bring into your home and to talk about them, maybe not all at once, but maybe throughout the week. Developing a student personal safety and a crisis plan that fits your family situation. And then using a student action plan against bullying. And clarity is the one thing my daughter always asks me for. Mom, can you be more clear with me? Don't assume they understand. Make sure that they can say, oh, I understand because this is what you said. And I'd like to, uh, involving parent educators and students, if you have something going on at home, tell us at the schools, please. Because when I walk into the schools and I find out that a do uh, one of the young lady's sisters has brain cancer and I have to deal with that at that very moment and I didn't know that was going to hit me, please tell us. Tell us what's going on. Tell us if it's a medication change. Tell us if there's a, a divorce. Tell us if there's an illness. We need to know so that we can be more empathetic with these children. And the last thing that I offer to you, two things. One, is there something called contract expand parenting? So I happen to have, um, a, I happen to have a co-parent, my husband. And the thing that we've learned over the years is that I am limited and my husband is limited. So we decided in parenting that we would take our limitations and when there was a crisis that came up, and there were plenty, unfortunately, but there are, if I wasn't good at something, I handed it over to my husband and vice versa. We took the egos off the table and we said, you know what, I am not connecting with that child well right now, I'm so angry. But these are my observations, can you deliver? And the answer was always yes, of course, and we're still doing it and our kids are well onto their 30s. And the final thing I leave with you is that hurt people hurt people. I'm gonna say that one more time. Hurt people hurt people. If someone is hurting, they're gonna hurt people. Thank you. I turn it over and I think we get to talk Conversations, right? Yes, that's yes, right. Thank that's you. right. So, if you did fill out a card and have a question, you can get that to Pastor Tom, um, or he'll. You can raise your hand if you have one, and so he, we can. He can give those to me, and I can uh, field those to our panel. They have their own microphones now. I confused them. They thought the microphones were for now, or for, well, for the earlier presentation, but it's for now. Uh, so. Does anyone have a question that you would like to ha address to the panel and get an answer for? It can also be directly related to Woodland and to the, you know, don't be afraid. Correct. Yeah, if you have a question about uh, Woodland Middle School, um, staffing, how they're responding, you know, anything like that, Amy would be able to help with that, those type of questions as well. Yes, ma'am. I'll let Amy respond to that, but I'll, 
all the resources that are back on those, on those tables in the lobby. Take as many of those as you want. Uh, you can wipe us out if you want. And I will tell you that this is being recorded tonight. So you, you'll be able to access the, no, this is good. Uh, this is good, not a bad thing. Uh, letting you know that it's being recorded so you can share this with those who weren't able to come tonight. Yeah, that'd be great. Amy, do you have anything in response to her question? Well, I, I want to make sure that you know what kind of care is going on at the school level, perhaps. Is that how you're thinking about it, or just? Our, you said that the Health Care County is doing a good job. Does that mean, I don't even know, but I have a child in the elementary school, and the middle school. Were the children made aware of what happened, even though we're not, does my son know about this, and I don't even know he knows about this? Hmm. So the way Sarasota County schools typically handle this it's it's handled uh at the school level so at woodland on the monday and tuesday and wednesday uh when her, the young lady's name is rachel yeah um they they bring in counselors a, 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 a lot i can't even remember the number and 150 students at woodland on monday on that particular monday did use the counselors and it happened again on Tuesday that Tuesday 150 more and now our school counselors are you know um, doing the work as as our admin as outside agencies are coming in one of the problems um, that happens is when we have tragedies like this there's an adrenaline rush and it lasts for about two, three days, maybe four. And then the following week, um, the adults um, sort of spiral down as well while they were supporting everyone. And then the administration a couple weeks later. So we're kind of in this space where different people need different supports at different times because grief is not a linear trajectory. So we're bringing in grief counselors still so to your question about does your son know in an elementary school, the answer may be no, because the resources are put hard at, a, at that one school, but the other schools are prepared for conversations, but it's not the hard forces that are coming in. And people, are, we're, we're limited at this point as well, because we're exhausted from COVID. So we have all these other layers, and then when something this big happens, we have to have outside sources come in and support us as well. So it's very layered. I also want Hello? Okay. I also wanted to add, as a counselor, I've had some students come to me when this happened, um, mostly middle school and high schoolers, so maybe not an elementary school, and this is also for those who might watch the recording. Um, your school might not tell you, or the school might not tell the student about what happened, but there is social media, and kids do post about these things. And I have some kids who knew this girl. So the conversations we were having is, I have a friend who's being bullied, and she's feeling suicidal, what do I do? Or I'm being bullied, and I'm feeling suicidal, what do I do? And so we're having those conversations. So I really encourage, you know, as parents, caregivers, family members, adults in these kids' lives to encourage those conversations, especially if you have a middle schooler or a high schooler or a very social elementary schooler who likes to talk to people, have some suspicion that they might know that this is happening because kids do like to talk. And we all know kids are not very good at keeping secrets from each other. They're good at keeping it from the adults, but not each other. Is that helpful? Okay. There is something that you should know. Right now, the problem that's going on is with the adults on social media because they are blaming another young lady for pushing Rachel to where she got to. So part of it is an adult issue going on. And until, again, we check our behaviors, I mean, I'm being very blunt and very clear, we're part of the problem right now. And that's not helping. So when you are talking to your other moms or for those who will be watching this media if our social media pages aren't bringing joy and happiness and nice things 
then we need to relook at our own social media pages too. If it's not doing something good, then we have to reevaluate because our kids are hurting right now. And this family, I, it, it's the worst nightmare of any parent. So I have a follow-up question based on that uh, question and your, com your comments. Um, is, what's the difference between, let's say, talking to a seven-year-old and a 13-year-old about bullying? Is there a difference? Uh, or even suicidal uh, thoughts? How would you answer that? Hi. Yeah, it's Hello? On. It's on. Okay. Um, so looking at this from a developmental perspective, um, there is a difference in how we talk to somebody who is seven years old versus 13 years old because, hello? There we okay. Go. <laughs> but could everyone hear me before? Do I need to repeat myself? Okay. So we would talk to a seven-year-old versus a 13-year-old very differently because of the stages of development that they are. Children generally don't understand abstract thinking until between the ages of about 10 to 12. So when you start the conversation with children about social media, safety, things like that, you're gonna use much more simple language to a seven-year-old in preparation for when they get older and you can have more difficult conversations. One great example of that, and all of you as parents and older family members have experience with, is setting boundaries. The boundary that you set with a two-year-old is gonna be very different from a boundary you set with a 13-year-old very different from a boundary you set with a 17-year-old. And so when you start those conversations, you're starting much simpler and maybe with stricter boundaries, like, hey, you can play on your tablet 30 minutes a day. When they get older and learn to be more responsible, you can have increased responsibilities. Does that answer your question? Yeah, any other thoughts about? So I was paired with a third grade student today, a young boy at a local elementary school, and he has been struggling with behaviors and we sat down together first time I had met him and he said and I said why are we meeting <laughs> you know like what what are we doing in here together he goes well I've had really poor behavior I said all right so tell me what that means to you he said well I've been the bullier mm -hmm. I'm like oh my goodness um, okay and then he told his story and I asked him how his behavior is in the last couple weeks he says, I'm really proud of myself. I'm really trying, and I have not gotten in trouble in the last two weeks. I'm really trying to be kinder and nicer. I said, oh, that's, that's just lovely, right? So he led the conversation, and he got into some detail, and my response was just that, a response, you know, pause, think, parent, right, like, and in, in listening. So sometimes, kids will tell us exactly what they need if we give them the space to do so. Yes. Yes. Did you say it's really bad? Is it really bad? Oh, yeah. Oh, it's awesome. You are correct. Yes, it is terrible. So, yes, there are anti there, every school in Sarasota County, uh, to my knowledge, uh, does have an anti-bullying uh, program process. Some of the problem that we're having is what kids hear outside of school and bring inside. And we can't change that <laughs> without a community response, right? Mm -hmm. So I would absolutely sit down with leadership in any elementary school that you're in, in a positive way, and come to the table with solutions instead of complaints. Complaints don't go far unless you have a solution. So if you have some ideas, and if you have a relationship with a leadership, that's how we get things done. And you can tell us at the Lean On Me Project, because then we'll bring it right in. <laughs> we, you know, whatever ideas you have, you know, we'll bring it right to leadership and we're getting things done. I mean, it's student by student, it's day by day, it's a process, but it's a problem and it needs addressing and we need leadership from parents to come in and say, this is what I see, 
can we do this? And the, the idea is to get to yes, right? So I'm so glad you brought it up. And welcome to Sarasota County. <laughs> <laughs> and before Grizel has a comment, the student action plan that's listed on the last slide, there's copies of that out on the table. And I think that could be a helpful way to generate conversation with your child, but also involve the educators at your child's school, right? Sure. Grizel? I also want to add intentionality from caregivers and community because as a counselor sometimes it's exhausting when you're giving feedback you're trying to assist parents and caregivers and you know the first few weeks you know we're doing these behaviors we're motivated we're getting things done and then it's kind of like we get burned out or we forget and we go back to old behaviors and that's a pattern I see a lot so I really encourage that when you do go to the schools when you do reach out to your kids that these are continued actionable steps that we're taking that are sustainable and are permanent because that's what the kids need kids thrive off of structure they thrive off of consistency and it's only not only towards the kids who are being bullied it's also towards the kids who are the bullies I do work with some elementary kids who are bullying other kids sometimes their own siblings and I have to sit with parents and explain to them you know the modeling behaviors and how to have conversations with kids and then I'll sometimes have parents calling me crying frustrated because nothing's working and I'll say well have you been doing the things that we've been talking about they're like yeah I worked for like three days and then I stopped and I'm like well you have to be consistent right you have to keep on practicing it because it's not normal in your household yet and just by doing it three times doesn't mean it's going to change and fix everything fast there has to be consistency and practice like a muscle that you're working on I have a question, but anyone else have one before I ask one? Okay, so if a parent would like to approach their, it, it, their child's teacher or the principal, AP, whoever, and that they're fearful for two reasons. One, they're just afraid, or they, they're worried that they can't maintain their anger. What would you say to them of how to prepare themselves to best represent themselves and their student? Great question. So one thing I encourage parents to do is practice self-regulation, right? I call it co-regulation. When we practice to manage our own emotions, we're also teaching our kids how to manage their emotions. So, you know, um, let me see if I can remember. I think it goes, one second. I can't remember how it goes. I, it's like a rhyme I tell kids, and for some reason I'm too tired to remember it. But the idea is pretty much that you take 10 deep breaths, you count to 10. Oh, take deep breaths, count to 10, now I can think again. That's what I tell kids. So as parents and as adults in their lives, we have to model these self-regulation skills, going for walks, taking deep breaths, writing in a journal, writing out our feelings or drawing our feelings however we express ourselves. So just gathering our thoughts and sometimes just writing down bullet points of what we want to say and talk about helps. But we really want to practice these self-regulating skills because that's also what we're teaching our children because, you know, kids copy us they model after us and we don't even have to be parents kids just model after anybody they spend a lot of time with or even see once right it's like you cuss that one time and now they're just saying it over and over and over again <laughs> right it's like oh now I have permission because I heard it once um, so really just practicing self-regulation writing down your thoughts before you go in go for a walk do a self check-in before you go to that meeting or before you reach out. Make sure you're coming from a place of wanting change versus a place of anger. Did you have anything? So this question comes up for IEP meetings in, um, for children who um, need special education uh, and 504s. And the number one thing that we talk about is practice what you want to say and write down the things that are meaningful and have solutions. The, the one problem that we suffer from truly in the education system is the ability to wait and listen and to stay calm because we are so emotional. They're our kids. I mean, like, you know, the mama bear. <laughs> I've been a mama bear. Um, so it, it, it's so important that when you're going to the school that you also know that they have a perspective and you have a perspective and we have to get to yes and it's not easy but it's possible and that's the key it, it takes a it takes a lot of work it's practice I, I don't know how else to say okay. it's practice sure. 
Any other questions? Thoughts? All right, well, we're going to, uh, I'm going to pass it back to Pastor Tom uh, to close us this evening. Uh, we'll, we'll be here as long as you want to talk to us one-on-one. -on -one. Maybe, you know, raising your hand is too much, and that's okay. Uh, we'll be here to talk with you as long as you would like this evening. Uh, Pastor Tom, thank you for inviting us to be here. Um, by the way, this is happening again Sunday evening, uh, just at the Lakefront Church out on Executive Drive off of, what's the road? Jack Aranda, yes. Uh, so if uh, you know people who weren't able to come tonight, Sunday night at 5 is when that event will be happening. So thank you for having us this evening. Pastor Tom, if you'll come close us. We do appreciate you being here. And it will be at 5 o'clock out at uh, the uh, Jacaranda uh, Lakefront Campus. We keep saying it's behind the Wawa on the Jacaranda, so people kind of know where that is. We are thankful that you came, and we appreciate our panel being here. Thank you for helping us through this. It's a difficult time. Uh, we've always had bullies, but it seems that bullying today has reached a much a higher level. Social media has increased that uh, exponentially, and we appreciate them helping us how to deal with those issues. So let's pray. Father, uh, we recognize our problems are beyond ourselves. We really need you to intervene. So we pray that with parents that you're intervening so that they know how to pattern, uh, how to behave in front of their children. We pray for our kids that they learn proper way of handling being bullied and the proper way of not becoming the bully. So we thank you that it's really through the power of your Holy Spirit that we ask in this community um, that, Father, you intercede. We pray again for uh, Rachel's family. We just pray that strength, encouragement to them. We thank you for our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being here.